Dr. Elizabeth Alexander is a poet, essayist, playwright, critic, teacher, and chair of the African American Studies Department at Yale University. She also mentors emerging African American poets serving on the faculty of Kaveh Kanem. Her six books of poems include American Sublime, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and was one of the American Library Association's notable books of the year. She has received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, two Pushcart Prizes, the George Kent Award, which was given by Gwendolyn Brooks, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and she was the inaugural recipient of the Jackson Prize for Poetry awarded by Poets and Writers, for which Lucille Clifton was a judge. And speaking of inaugurations, in January 2009, Elizabeth Alexander joined the ranks of Robert Frost, Maya Angelou, and Miller Williams, becoming only the fourth poet in American history to present a poem at a presidential inauguration. <laughs> Elizabeth's praise song for the day, which was commissioned by then President-elect Barack Obama, was described by Publishers Weekly as a moving pictorial elegy. The poet Clarence Manger has noted Alexander's instinct for turning her profound cultural vision into one that illuminates universal experience. We're thrilled to have Elizabeth with, with us today to illuminate the life and poems of Lucille Clifton. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Alexander. There it shall perch. It'll be fine. Thank you, Jen, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. If the alarm comes again, it, it certainly is Lucille. Um, that one wasn't Lucille. Uh, it didn't do anything beautiful. Uh, rethinking Lucille Clifton. Lucille, Lucille, a light, illuminata. Though Lucille is not gone, her body is gone from this earth. And I know I'm not alone in this room today missing the actual Lucille, always missing her. But the invitation to write this lecture coincided with the publication of the collected poems of Lucille Clifton, edited so beautifully by Kevin Young and Michael Glazer, introduced with such insight and flint by Toni Morrison. The book opens with a treat a group of poems from 1965 and the years to follow not collected in book form. And then the editor, editors generously weave those unpublished poems throughout the book uh, along with the published poems with everything in its proper chronological order. We can see then the wingspan of her work, her body of work, its magnitude, its evolving light motifs, her ongoing concerns, her deepening understanding and her always recognizable voice, clear and swift as a stream, deep as an ocean. Today, I want to think anew about the large preoccupations of her work over 50 years. Because, I, and when I say think anew and why I think the opportunity is, um, is such an apt one, given that we have this book, you know, uh, Lucille Clifton is a very familiar poet to many of us, and we could probably in this room together uh, recite uh, a half a dozen. Uh, I could tell you what they would be, you know what they would be as well. Homage to my hips, won't you celebrate with me? These poems are deeply, deeply well-known American anthems. But I thought that rather uh, uh, than, than do that, I wanted us to listen and hear her from beginning to end and hear her with some shadings and groupings to get a sense of, of really how ambitious and how mighty her project is. I also want to read many of these poems out loud in groupings that will help us understand her larger aims and also so that our ears will take it in. So Lucille will give this lecture along with me. Uh, I will talk about aspects of her work, uh, to name a few, confronting mortality, uh, engaging uh, the, uh, the winnowing body, philosophical questions as poetic method, 
Intertextuality, and uh, Ars Poeticas, uh, which she wrote. She wrote many of them. She didn't call them that, but she did it all the, all the, all the time. Nothing human is alien to me is ascribed to Terence and Cicero and reprised by Robert Hayden in The Peacock Room. Nothing human is alien to the poet Lucille Clifton. In her poems, we learn that to be human is to suffer. To be human is to survive. To be human is to harm others. To be human is to testify. To be human is to exalt power. To be human is to notice small things and name them. The last time I saw Lucille was a bit over a year before she died when we brought her to my campus for a reading. The occasion was glorious and the pinnacle for me, there we go. Keep going. Um, she came to my class and held forth for my students, an unusually intense and devoted group who, have spent, who had spent the semester diligently studying 20th century African American poetry. One of those students, several years later now, wrote me recently to say she still had a copy of Study the Masters on, uh, tacked on her wall and that she particularly read it every day as a lead up to the presidential election. I'll remind you, like my Aunt Timmy, it was her iron, or one like hers, that smoothed the sheets the master poet slept on. Home or hotel, what matters is, he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed, too, words, some Cherokee, some Maasai, and some huge and particular as hope. And that is her mantra uh, moving towards the presidential uh, election. Uh, so at the end of the class, when Lucille visited, she called us into a circle, which was one of her pedagogical mainstays to call students into a circle and, uh, and hold hands. And I wept, thinking that somehow, because Lucille was there, it was okay that I was boohooing in front of my students. Uh, I wept to think that they had spent a semester taking such studious care with our legacy of black poetry, and that they had the profound privilege of hearing someone who I loved so much and who had so much to teach them. For Lucille Clifton, to be human is to tell the truth. To be human is to stand in a circle with other human beings and hold their hands. After Lucille died, I wrote a poem, uh, or really she gave me a poem uh, that came like a small atomic offshoot of her poem, The Light That Came to Lucille Clifton, a little mold spore from that great poem that landed on my piece of paper and turned into something else. Um, and so um, this is The Light That Came to Lucille Clifton, surely one of her master works. The light that came to Lucille Clifton came in a shift of knowing when even her fondest sureties faded away. It was the summer she understood that she had not understood and was not mistress even of her own off eye. Then the man escaped, throwing away his tie, and the children grew legs and started walking, and she could see the peril of an unexamined life. She closed her eyes, afraid to look for her authenticity, but the light insists on itself in the world. A voice from the non-dead past started talking. She closed her ears and it spelled out in her hand. You might as well answer the door, my child. The truth is furiously knocking. And so then I uh, uh, wrote a poem that she breathed into me from the nearby other side. Uh, one week later in The Strange. One week later in the strange exhilaration after Lucille's death, our eyes were bright as we received instructions, lined up with all we were supposed to do. Now seers, now grace notes, now anchors, now tellers, now keepers and spreaders, now wide open arms. The cold wind of generational shift blew all around us, stinging our cheeks, awakening us to the open space now everywhere surrounding. 
For the last six months, I have talked to Lucille, beseeching her, knowing there was something that she understood and could share with me about surviving in the wake of tremendous loss made more violent by its suddenness. I wanted to know how she understood catastrophe. I wanted to know if she believed that we are not given more than we can bear. And she answered, sometimes we're given more than we can bear. I wanted to know if I was still a poet because grief had remade me and I did not know what language I spoke. And so that conversation, that conversation made possible by the understanding that she gave us in her work that there is porosity between the realms uh, is something that is ongoing. In her book, Two-Headed Woman, we see uh, it's a kind of a coming out book, a coming out into her seerdom, into second sightedness, into the extraordinary of the ordinary. The word ordinary, which goes all the way throughout her work, is uh, used to express a kind of disappointment uh, in her earlier work from a woman who wanted more, expected more from her life. But then it comes back. Her vocabulary is very spare across her, her books, and in this way, I think that she is very, very much like William Blake, and I'll come to that later, when we see how the words evolve over the course of this whole body. How her poems understood gesture, how they practiced the pith of mother wit, mother wit, each poem a perfect thing, each word a meditation stone. Illuminate, she did, over and over again. Back to those vocabulary words, the words repeated and turning in the light. Light, fingers, fox, woman, mama, mad, ordinary, extraordinary, remember, disremember, white man, next, daughter, message, Lucille, Lucille Clifton. And over and over again, the lift or lament, the cry or exaltation, the pain or ecstasy of, oh, I, lo I, you, I lost count of all of the lines that begin with, oh, used in very, very different ways each time in this work. And to the philosophical, most of the poems have questions in them, real questions, unanswerable questions, questions of a lifetime, philosophical. Who can answer any of these questions for sure? There is surety or terra firma in her not answering the questions that characterizes so many of these poems. In these poems, every word is in some way true. In this new book, um, Kevin Young, in his afterward, tells us about how he's placed the poems in their proper chronological place, as I mentioned in the book. Um, he worked uh, from her archive, which is at Emory University now, and contains all kinds of stuff that is still unprocessed, that still hasn't made it into book form, uh, including um, notebooks with spirit writing in it and all kinds of extraordinary things. He was working uh, largely with a folder that was first called old poems and then old poems and ones that may not be poems or maybe should be thrown away one day. That was the title of the folder. <laughs> uh, and then eventually she turned the title of the folder to bad poems. And Young cleverly reads that as bad poems as in black bad, vernacular bad, uh, poems meant to be kept because she was also known for throwing many poems away. And uh, again, it, it's, it's a wonderful um, afterword and he himself talks about rescuing poems from the trash can and her children have talked about rescuing poems from the trash can. So these poems were kept by a thrower awayer. Um, uh, and uh, you know, as we know, some people think every word should be kept <laughs> and every utterance is precious. To continue the themes that, that encircle the book, she is always engaging history, and the poems have a very profound understanding of history and of black history as the carotid arted artery of American history. That is what she shows us over and over and over again. In 1965, she is in full command of the voice and philosophy we would know her for throughout her career and fully engaged with this history. And so this first uh, poem in the book is called Black Women. America made us heroines, not wives. We learned the tricks to keep the race together. 
but had to leave our men to find themselves, and now they damn what they cannot forgive. Even old Massa's son lives in a dream, remembering the lie we made him love. America made us heroines, not wives. We hid our ladiness to save our lives. Black Women, 1965. The poem uses a, a, a bit more conspicuous rhyme than we're used to in Clinton, which neatly, neatly um, uh, packages um, the, the sort of rough conclusion of the poem. We hid our ladiness to save our lives in a kind of nursery rhyme memorability. Clifton's work is a primer on America, as always, and on the deep conundrums of black American womanhood. There could be no better or more concise essay on what feminist theory came to call intersectionality uh, or uh, what has been written of as competing identities and so forth than this that I've just uh, read to you. And Clifton always seemed to understand the stakes as well of survival in these bodies we move in. In this poem, Conversation Overheard in a Graveyard, again, one of the very early unpublished ones, um, she sets up for us this idea that it's perfectly logical to address a dead person, to expect that that dead person will hear you uh, and, and might perhaps answer, uh, answer back. Uh, and so we see, uh, uh, we hear about, see her addressing her mother, a thwarted poet who burned her verses because her husband, Clifton's father, disapproved. Uh, and whose own poetry uh, uh, was uh, avenged, if you will, by Lucille Clifton's becoming a poet, uh, her abusive father, uh, addressed directly as though that she, they could be heard, she could be heard. So first, conversation overheard in a graveyard. And this is the historical, and then we move to the family. Harriet, this place has made us heroines, not wives, and kept us from its sparkles and its paints, and made us dull in natural disguise. Sojourner, we've lost our ladyhood but saved our lives. Harriet, what mirror will remember you and me suckling strangers and sons? Sojourner, history. And then here, dear mama. Dear mama, here are the poems you never wrote. Here are the plants you never grew. All that I am, I am for him. All that I do, I do for you. And so this, uh, this, continues, um, this continues throughout. Um, I also, and again, I'm just sort of touching on these different themes, um, was very, very struck by the literariness and intertextuality um, of these poems. You know, again, one of the ways that Clifton gets talked about uh, and will continue to get talked about, I mean, even in that review in the New York Times, which I had a conversation with my mother, she said, it's, it, they spelled her name right, and people will buy the book. And I said, <laughs> I said, but he was wrong <laughs> when he said Clifton is not well served by this large and unwieldy, uh, you know, da 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 da. And really, her great book is Good Times, 1969, and uh, and then sort of more of the very stuff that uh, Toni Morrison debunks, where you know, kind of this is our mother, this is this uh, ever enveloping, uh, you know, uh, black woman who's waiting to love us all the time and make us feel better about ourselves. Um, and so, and what, what Morrison says in her introduction is, I want to hear about her intellect. I want to hear about the intellect of these poems. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how these are literary works. These are works written by a poet who writes poems because she read poems. Um, uh, this is one of the early uncollected, um, and it is untitled. Those boys that ran together at Tillman's and the pool room, everybody see them now thinks it's a shame. Everybody see them now, remember, they was fine boys. We have some fine black boys. Don't it make you want to cry? Now, I'm sure some of you here can uh, tell me who that poem is talking to. Um, uh, a poem song to Gwendolyn Brooks. Uh, two of her poems in particular, um, one that you all know, We Real Cool, Seven at the Golden Shovel, also set in a pool room. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we thin gin, we sing sin, we jazz June, we die soon. And the even greater 
Life of Lincoln West, uh, not Life of Lincoln West, that's great too, um, of DeWitt Williams on his way to Lincoln Cemetery, excuse me. Uh, he was born in Alabama, he was raised in Illinois, he was nothing but a plain black boy. Swing low, sweet chariot, nothing but a plain black boy. And it describes his funeral cortege down 47th Street underneath the L, underneath the pool rooms that he, know, he loved so well. You know, so it's the same, uh, uh, the same scene, right? But what I think is really interesting in the Clifton is that her vernacular is easier than Brooks. She is kind of lean modernism to Brooks's ornate modernism. Clifton also, also consistently wrote in her named body, a black woman's body, a body with hips, eventually one breasted, a body anatomized, a body that issued forth six children, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Her blues are a mother's blues writ large. Brooks's mandate was different. She couldn't have made her way that way, writing from a, a, a different explicitly embodied black era. It's the generational difference, I think, of coming of age in the 1940s and coming to voice in the middle 1960s. Um, but um, those poems are very, very much in conversation. Um, she writes a poem um, borrowing the form from her great friend Sonia Sanchez. Who, uh, who sort of made up or tailored a form called the Song Coup, uh, and this is Clifton's. His heart, this is also uncollected, they said, but much later. His heart, they said, was three times the regular size. Yes, I said, I know. And uh, what's being described in the context of that poem in its grouping, um, it's that it's talking about um, uh, the heart of Fred Clifton, uh, of her husband, uh, after he has died, the literal heart, right? But of course, you know, it, it's, it's a wonderful, a wonderful turn. Um, and then uh, I mentioned Blake, uh, and he comes as a wonderful reward in this book. Um, you know, I'm sort of thinking, Blake, 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 as I'm reading through, and then on page 512, the poem, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> saw them, which I would also put in the intertextuality category, but it also moves us into the Ars Poetica poems. Saw them glittering in the trees, their quills erect among the leaves, angels everywhere. We need new words for what this is, this hunger entering our loneliness like birds, stunning our eyes into rays of hope. We need the flutter that can save us, something that will swirl across the face of what we have become and bring us grace. Back north, I sit again in my own home, dreaming of Blake, searching the branches for just one poem. Um, uh, and then, um, finally, um, uh, uh, and this kind of overlaps with um, uh, the poems that deal with the anatomized body, um, a very important uh, poem and conversation because it is a lifelong one, though it has not yet been charted, dissertation waiting to be written, um, is um, uh, Clifton's relationship to Toni Morrison. Um, so Lucille Clifton and Toni Morrison and Amiri Baraka attended Howard University together. Imagine that. Mm. There were all kinds of other interesting people there and all kinds of other interesting people teaching there as well. Um, but I name those three titans for you to sort of take a moment and, and think about that. Um, and then Toni Morrison, when she was at Random House, was Clifton's editor of her memoir, A Good Woman, uh, and uh, remained in her, her life throughout. So this is um, uh, Clifton's uh, latish poem, Love the Human, which takes its title from Gary Snyder. So that's the first poetic conversation that she places herself in with the title, but then I'll talk about Morrison afterwards. Love the Human. The rough weight of it scarring its own back. The dirt under the fingernails, the bloody cock. Love, the thin line secting the belly, the small gatherings gathered in sorrow or joy. Love the silences, love the terrible noise, love the stink of it, love it all, love. Even the improbable foot, even the surprised and ungrateful eye. Love the human. Uh, and I think um, that surely um, this is uh, in conversation with um, Baby Sugg's Sermon on the Mount in Beloved. Uh, in the silence that followed, Baby Suggs wholly offered up to them her great big heart. Here, she said, in this here place we flesh, flesh that weeps, 
laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it. Love it hard. Yonder they do not love your flesh. They despise it. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder they flay it, and oh my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them, raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You got to love it, you, and know they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give leavings instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved, feet that need to rest and dance, backs that need support, shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight, so love your neck, put a hand on it, grace it stroke it and hold it up and all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs you got to love them the dark dark liver love it love it and the beating beating heart love that too and so it goes on uh, and so I think that um, what the Morrison correlation reveals for us um, is it surfaces uh, we, in, a, in a different kind of, you know, she's working in a sort of a fulsome prose, but what it surfaces for us is, again, this deep, deep understanding about the core corrosion of slavery in American history and culture and how that was never, ever, ever far from Clifton's understanding of the body uh, and of the black body in, in particular. Um, I think also when you look at those together, you, you know, you're reminded of something that Clifton often said, many of you have heard her say, said that, say this, I come to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Um, rooted in a deep understanding of American history and the corrosions of its racial past as they press into the present uh, and that surfaces unflinchingly in the very best black literature. Um, just a few poems about writing poems. Uh, uh, Ars Poeticas, though she doesn't call them that. The Message of Thelma Sales. And these are just short, and I'm going to whip through them. The Message of Thelma Sales. Baby, my only husband turned away. For 20 years, my door was open. Nobody ever came. The first fit broke my bed. I woke from ecstasy to ask, what blood is this? Am I the bride of Christ? My bitten tongue was swollen for three days. I thrashed and rolled from fit to death. You are my only daughter. When you lie awake in the evenings, counting your birthdays, turn the blood that clots your tongue into poems, poems. And then somewhere, somewhere, some woman, just like me, tests the lock on the window in the children's room lays out tomorrow's school clothes, sets the table for breakfast early, finds a pen between the cushions on the couch, sits down and writes the words, good times, the title of her first book. I think of her as I begin to teach the lives of the poets about her space at the table and my own inexplicable life. And then, when I stand around among poets, I am embarrassed mostly. Their long white heads, the great bulge in their pants, their certainties. I don't know how to do what I do in the way that I do it. It happens despite me and I pretend to deserve it. But I don't know how to do it. Only sometimes when something is singing, I listen and so far I hear, too. When I stand around among poets, sometimes I hear a single music in us, one note dancing us through the singular moving word world. And then finally, uh, and this one is important, Lucifer speaks in his own voice. Sure as I am of the seraphim folding wing, so I am certain of a graceful bed and a soft caress along my long belly at end time. It was to be I who was called son. 
if only of the morning, saw that some must walk or all will crawl, so slithered into earth and seized the serpent in the animals. I became the Lord of Snake for Adam and for Eve. I, the only Lucifer, light bringer, created out of fire. Illuminate I could, and so illuminate I did. Uh, and so, of course, you know, Lucifer is Lucille's, uh, she's just too attentive to, to, to her name and its meanings. Lucifer is Lucille's mighty, voracious, gobbling alter ego. Uh, 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 and uh, it's a poetic persona that grows mightier and allows her in some ways to overstep or say the things uh, that don't uh, get said in other poems. As I went through this reading of her poems over the last months, uh, I came back to what she has always known about death and dying and fragile bodies. Uh, you know, to say that she, uh, after, you know, you read these obituaries and things that say after a long battle with cancer, but of course with Lucille it was after many long battles with cancer and with kidney disease, you know, I mean she just, her, her body uh, survived and survived and survived and survived. Uh, and she's always understood uh, that there was something borrowed in the body's continuous movement. Uh, and uh, you see her sort of moving toward a deeper and deeper understanding of that as the poems go along. Um, this is her poem, When He Was Dying. As he was dying, excuse me. As he was dying, a canticle of birds hovered, watching through the glass as if to catch that final breath and sing it where he died. There was a shattering of wing that sounded, then did not sound, and we stood in this silent black, silence blackly, some would say, while through the windows, as perhaps at other times, the birds, if they had stayed, could see us, and I do not mean white here, but as we are, transparent women and transparent men. And then to follow, she lived. After he died, what really happened is she watched the days bundle into thousands, watched every act become the history of others, every bed more narrow. But even as the eyes of lovers strained toward the milky young, she walked away from the hole in the ground, deciding to live. And she lived. And uh, so uh, along the lines of temporality, uh, poems upon poems, wonderful um, uh, poems, the poem June 20th, which is herself before she is born, uh, and uh, a poem to a grandchild before it's been conceived, uh, uh, a poem in full conversation uh, with a grandchild who's just been born, and the grandchild uh, answers back. Uh, and uh, poems of tremendous, tremendous lament as well uh, across uh, uh, this void, um, and this one uh, to a son who has died. Um, o oh Absalom, my son, my son, even as I turned myself from you, I longed to hold you, O oh my wild-haired son running in the wilderness away from me, from us, into a thicket you could not foresee. If you had stayed, I feared you would kill me. If you left, I feared you would die. Oh, my son, my son, what does the Lord require? And that last, what does the Lord require, is she does this a few times. It's a question without a question mark, so it's also a statement. Uh, so it is a plaint, it is a cry, it is a question, uh, oh Lord, what do you require? Um, but it is also um, a statement uh, as though there is an answer, what does the Lord require? But of course the poem stops and there is no answer. Um, I want to read this late poem. There's still just one that I want to make sure we don't miss. Um, there are, are too many, um, but in moving toward uh, death, uh, birthday, 1999, it is late. The train that is coming is closer. A woman can hear it in her fingers, in her knees, in the space where her uterus was. 
The platform feels filled with people, but she sees no one else. She can almost hear the bright train eye. She can almost touch the cracked seat labeled Lucille. Someone should be with her. Someone should undress her, stroke her one more time, and the train keeps coming closer. It is a dream I am having more and more and more. Uh, and then uh, just two lines from O oh, Antic, God, return me, return to me, my mother in her 30s, leaned across the front porch, the huge pillow of her breasts pressing against the rail, summoning me in for bed. I am almost the dead woman's age, times two. And a continual hearing of, uh, of her name being called uh, the poem Dialysis, which is probably familiar to many of you. Uh, and then in the very, very last poems of the book, Uncollected, uh, some, poem, some points along some of the meridians. A long poem that I'm not going to read, but that's sectioned into heart, lung, stomach, liver, kidney, large intestine, spleen, and gates. Uh, so this is the movement that she's chronicling uh, as she knows the body is, is moving towards death. Art replaces the light that is lost when the day fades, the moment passes, and the evanescent extraordinary makes its quicksilver. Art tries to capture that which we know leaves us as we move in and out of each other's lives, as we all must eventually leave this earth. Great artists know that shadow and work always against the dying light, but always knowing that the day brings new light and that the ocean which washes away all traces on the sand leaves us a new canvas with each wave. It's a fact, and it's a fact relevant to the work of Lucille Clifton. Black people in this country die more easily at all ages, across genders, more catastrophically. Look at how young black men die, how middle-aged black men drop dead, how black women's health is ravaged by the stress of living. The numbers graph to poverty, but they also graph to stre stresses known and invisible. How did we come here, after all? Not with upturned chins and bright eyes, but rather in chains across a, cha across a chasm. Then later, some of us as refugees from the death squads and disappearings of our own cousins. But what did we do? We built a nation and we built its art. And so the black artist in some way, spoken or not, contends with death, races against it, writes amongst the ghosts who we call ancestors. We listen for the silences and make that art. Don't forget to feed the Loas, Ishmael Reed, who grew up with Clifton in Buffalo, New York, wrote. And so by making art, we feed the ancestors, leave water and a little food at the altars we have made for them and let them guide the work. Clifton teaches us this. We listen, we hasten to create. And so she also leaves us with the death of Fred Clifton, 11, 10, 84, age 49. That's the title of the poem, The Death of Fred Clifton. I seem to be drawn to the center of myself, leaving the edges of me in the hands of my wife. And I saw with the most amazing clarity, so that I had not eyes but sight. And rising and turning through my skin, there was all around not the shapes of things, but oh, at last, the things themselves. Survivors stand startled in the light, but bear witness, knowing more, a little bit more, about what the things are. And the black folk poets treat, speak the truth when they say, every shut I ain't sleep, every goodbye ain't gone. I await other poems born of the deep understanding Lucille Clifton has shown me as I wait to encounter my husband in a dream, dreams that have only come to me once. There is no woe I found like the woe of the first dream when a loved one newly dead comes to visit you. So palpable, so real, and then the moment when you realize it is a dream and they are leaving and time is running out and there's nothing you can do about it. You will awaken and the beloved will still be dead. Lucille's poems do not aim to reassure. They don't mean to, they never did. But they offer company and the real true knowledge that we're still figuring it all out right until the end, but that our ancestors are there with us and are in some way or will be 
available to us. These are the very last poems she wrote in her very last days on this earth, moving closer to the lit bones of truth as her body failed part by part. And they're very short, just three of them. After the children died, she started bathing only once in a while, started spraying herself with ginger, trying to preserve what remained of her heart. But the body insists on truth she did not want to be clean in such a difficult world, but there were other children. And she would not want me to tell you this. Haiku, over the mountains and under the stars, it is one hell of a ride. An American story, and I really love this one for a reason that you'll see, uh, another aspect of Lucille to the end, an American story. One year, a naked white guy parked his car by our elementary school. Kids called him the new dude and <laughs> laughed when they told the story. I didn't believe it because I was on the honor roll. Until the afternoon, he hopped at me all pink and sweaty and asked me, little girl, have you ever seen a white man's pride? And I replied, oh, yes, sir, many times, many times. Uh, <laughs> so that's our Lucille. Uh, and then, um, uh, finally, the very last poem with which I'll conclude, uh, which Young found tucked into her book of days in the February in which she died. Uh, and this last poem, in the middle of the eye, not knowing whether to call it devil or God, I asked how to be brave, and the thunder answered, stand, accept. So I stood, and I stood, and withstood the fiery sight. The command from the other side that remains for me after the water wears the rest away is stand, accept. Thank you very much.